now, from the Kingdom of Nye, more Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Here again is Art. Once again, John Myler, who has written a book called Aliens in the Bible. Yeah, the link uh, to his site is on my site right now, uh, www.artbell.com. Just go down to the name John Myler, and you can go over and look at his site. Uh, John, you know, again, a lot of Christians would say somebody who writes a book called Aliens in the Bible is committing blasphemy and why it's just, you know, it's ridiculous and... Uh, I, I have heard that, uh, and I've caught some flack over it. But, uh, have you? I bet you have. Yeah, consider this. 39 people killed themselves last year because they believed that they were on a rendezvous with, with alien beings. How do you know they weren't? <laughs> well, I'm sure they were, but they were not the kind of, benef- uh, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, kind, nice, sweet, gentle aliens that, that they would have uh, thought. To... You refer, of course, to the Heaven's Gate thing. Um, uh, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, they indeed thought they were going to... Uh, it had some... The marker, they said, was um, the comet, but they expected to end up on an alien ship. Yeah. I, I believe is what's correct. Hiding right? behind the comet or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, or, or what? wherever, actually, toward the end, they, they said, well, even though there may not be a so-called companion uh it doesn't matter that the comet itself is the sign and so you know i saw the videos and they were all happy 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 they were ready to go they they said they were looking forward to it at really at ease and looking forward to the trip and graduating schoolhouse earth and all the rest of it yes and you know this is this is kind of like this inner drive that i have because i just feel that the christian community needs to assert this question and you really touched on a key topic when you when you mentioned how are you going to be able to tell whether something is you know trying to deceive you or not? And, yes. Uh, there's there's something that I've been seeing in in this whole phenomenon, a message that I've been hearing over and over to people that say they channel these beings and such and so forth. Uh, there's two main messages. One is these beings planted humanity here on this earth. That's message number one. Right. Uh, message number two is. They're going to return soon, and when they do, they're going to bring humanity into a new age of enlightenment. Uh, or, is, uh, or come back for the harvest. Uh, yeah. Like now, see, what does the Bible say about that? Uh, first of all, Genesis 1 clearly indicates that the same God who said, let there be light, is the same one that planted humanity on the earth. Uh, Elohim is a plural word, and I've heard from, like, uh, say, Zachariah Sitchum and others that uh, they try to take that word and they turn it into angels and that there is angelic beings that put life on earth, but uh, that word is plural because it's denoting Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, so there should be no confusion about that. But wouldn't, um, to us, uh, to whatever we were, if you uh, toy with the concept uh, in 2001, for example, that there was intervention by an alien species of some sort, that there had, in fact, uh, can it go together, in other words, could there have been creation and then intervention at some point? Have you considered that? Well, Scripture is clear when it says God created man and breathed life into him. Yes. Now, there's obviously been uh, beings coming here and fiddling with people, but the ones that are mentioned in Scripture uh, are the not good ones. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, for instance, talks about uh, fallen angels that came to earth and Mated with humans, and they really screwed up the planet. Uh, the Nephilim, right? Uh, yeah, apparently they they convinced everybody they were, but uh, they were evil to the core to such a degree that God destroyed the entire planet as a result uh, in the that flood was of Noah. A, the flood of Noah, yes. Yeah, and uh, Jesus said that we're going to have a return to the days of the flood of, uh, or a return to the days of Noah when that kind of stuff was happening. Uh, Matthew twenty four fifteen and Luke twenty one twenty four both indicate. We're going to see a return to that, that these beings are going to return to this world. And it marries right in with this concept that uh, they are our creators. They're going to try to claim the title of God. And number one, that's blasphemy. Um, big, heavy, ugly word, but uh, that's what you call it. When you're jumping up and saying you're God, that's blasphemy. And uh, number two, they're trying to say that they're going to be the ones that are going to take the credit for 
humanity evolving into this new age of enlightenment. Well, question for you, uh, John. If such a creature uh, were to come down in a ship, land, claim to be God, and appear to have godlike powers, how many people now on Earth, six billion plus, percentage-wise, do you think would buy it? A lot, if they brought with them, uh, say, genetic enhancements, uh, sure. amazing technology. Better that color would... TV, whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, talk, think about technology that would be so advanced that if you integrated it into the human body, you would be telepathic and smarter than Einstein and more creative than Mozart and Picasso. Pretty godlike. Everybody would want that. And you hit the point right there, godlike. They will evolve us into God. This is their message. And it's the same message that Satan gave Eve in the garden. Eat this and you will be like God. Same temptation. And it's so obvious, and yet I hear it so often from people that are involved in this kind of phenomenon. And it wouldn't surprise me in the least if when these beings do show up, which I believe they will very soon, that this is what they're going to be. They're going to be here. They're going to be offering us all kinds of wonderful things. And it's going to be so good that... Uh, People are not going to think that there's anything that could possibly be wrong with them, and yet there's something wrong with that. It doesn't line up with what's in Scripture. John, have you ever heard me interview Major Ed Dames? I am sorry to say that I haven't. You haven't. I have been he, studying he, and studying all these different authors. Yes, he is a remote viewer. Okay. All right. I've heard about that. Um, I'm going to have him on. I'm also going to have Ingo Swan on. These are very famous remote I've viewers. Heard of in fact, Ingo, Swan. Ingo, in fact, is the originator of the whole remote viewing thing. Yeah. Ed Dames was in the military remote viewing program. Now, Ed undertook as a project remote viewing Satan. Oh boy! And yeah. you know that's what I said too. Oh boy! <laughs> Not such a bright idea. And you know, I, I said, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And he said, "Yes." And I don't think he's ever been the same since. Now, well, he can get himself fixed really quick if he does one simple thing. Yes. Uh, let me just continue a little with what he said. Okay. He actually encountered Satan in Satan's war, what he called Satan's war room. Okay. The entity he said Satan is real, mm -hmm. and that evil is being consistently planned. Now, at one point, Satan turned and and saw his presence, or felt his presence. And I thought that was a really, 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 really scary project. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure once you've had that encounter that you come out the same way. Yeah. Well, you see, I've known people that have been plagued with demonic entities, and uh, it's really not all the bells and whistles that you see in movies like The Exorcist. All it takes is a genuine faith in Jesus. and uh, You'd be amazed at, at the kind of things that you would see in you know, what you would consider an average church when it comes to demonic possession and deliverance from that kind of stuff. Did you ever hear me, Martin? No, I haven't. <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, he was the man after whom the movie the Exorcist was modeled. Mm -hmm. Father Martin has now passed on. As a matter of fact, I'm going to repeat on Sunday an interview I did with uh, Father Martin. Mm -hmm. But he described in some great graphic detail uh, many of the exorcisms that he has performed. Yes. And let me tell you, it was frightening stuff. I mean, for example, he would tell me that there have been priests who have died in the course of trying to get demon from somebody. And he's seen them die. Yeah. And he's felt close to that himself. In other words, it's a battle um, that um, you just cannot imagine. Uh, it's, it's such a battle. Yeah. yeah. I've seen that up close and personal. You have? Yes. And uh, let me just say that for those priests that died, um, to die in Christ is gain. So... They're doing all right. Uh, maybe they lost the battle over their physical body, but uh, they're doing just fine. And, uh, uh, you know, there, it is a real thing that there's there's some serious stuff going on out there. And uh, when you do get close to it, when it starts touching home, I mean, that 
personally, that is what brought me to Jesus, uh, because I was really deeply heavy, heavy involved in a lot of new agey things, Ouija boards and channeling and all that stuff. And oh, uh, I actually lured this kind of stuff into my life. Oh, and uh, oh, because John. of that, that was part of my personal testimony. And it, it does get a great deal personal, but uh, I'll just say that much that uh, there was some demonic stuff there, and it it revealed itself to me, and it was scary as hell. <laughs> But um, actually, wait, wait, since wait, then, I, I actually want to hear a little bit about this. Well, I didn't know you had this background. Well, yeah, I, I used to really be heavy into the uh, New Age type stuff. And... Like uh, Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. Now, Ouija boards scare me. I had one experience. I won't talk about it. Well, so. see, that's part of that's part of it. Uh, I, I uh, had an interest in Actually, I didn't think it would work. And me and another friend of mine got together and we... We're playing one, with one, thinking, oh, we'll just talk to an alien from another world or uh, an angel in heaven. Yes. And satanic phrases started coming out of this thing. And I took my hands off it. I looked at my friend. I said, look, you believe in God. I believe in God. Why is this thing saying all this garbage? And we were, like, looking at each other puzzled, and we figured we'd just give it another shot, and we kept doing it. And the darker it got, and the later in the evening it got, uh, the faster this thing would zip around, and then all these satanic things would come out and, you know, Lord had great mercy on me, because I did many things and dabbled in a lot of stuff, and I'm sure I had demonic influences all around me uh, up until... But, uh, yeah, that was a real eye-opener, all of those things that were coming about from that Ouija board. Well, all right. I had no idea you had that kind of background. Interesting. Um, the world... Uh, uh, Christianity is not the majority belief uh, in the world, Right. Oh, uh, well, as, as far as religion would go, I yes. would say it is. I, no. Now, how many people actually believe? Well, the Bible itself says it's the straight and narrow, so therefore not very many people. It's an awful lot of Buddhists and, yeah. you know, other religions. I know it's growing by leaps and bounds. Christianity? There's thousands of people that come to Jesus every year. Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. While the others are shrinking? Uh, yeah, a lot of it is... is Are being, you sure about that, John? I am 100% positive about that. That can be looked up. I know there was that much rice in the world. Oh, yeah, especially in your, your country, is like China. is sweeping China right now, even in the face of persecution where you have Christians getting killed left and right for their faith. And uh, actually, since Russia, since they have uh, opened their doors up and decided to allow this religion in, uh, it's been sweeping throughout Russia and all over the world, unlike ever before. Hmm. What happens to those who have not uh, received the word? Now, they might live and work and love and die without ever having the Christian word at all. Uh, hmm. I lived on the island of Okinawa, and they weren't Christians at all. They believed in, they worshipped their ancestors. Mm -hmm. That was their religion. Well, one now, thing you can so, be sure of is that God is a God of mercy. Uh, and the Bible also says that planted within the heart of every human being is a certain knowledge about God. And, you know, I, let me just tell you this one quick story. Uh, there was a, a story about a missionary who had been traveling, and he was on some re remote island, and he was just wandering through the jungle there looking for the nearest village and saw this man praying in English as some rock out there in the middle of nowhere. And so he started talking to the guy. It turns out the guy didn't know how to speak in English. He was speaking in tongues as he was praying. And that this guy was leaving his village to pray to a one God that he knew was a true God. And it wasn't anything to do with any of the people in his village. And this was a village where there was no gospel. So in, in summary, uh, I would say that for a people that do not know God or do not have any knowledge of God, God will send somebody because he's a merciful God. Will send somebody. Yes, he will send somebody. He will rise up a prophet, as it says in Scripture. All right. Uh, here we're at the bottom of the hour. John Myler is here, and he says they are here. And in fact, the book he wrote is called Aliens in the Bible. You might want to check it out. Did you ever listen to the words of this song, Girl, You Got Me Thirsty for Another Cup of Wine? You know what he means, right? Well, isn't that what got us into trouble in the first place? Some girl. 
with an apple. Yep, I think that was it. Just a brief reminder. The numbers you can reach us at. We're not quite ready to open the uh, phone lines yet, but that will occur shortly. John Myler is my guest. He'll be right back. Buyitnow.com. Interesting. A lot of people I know, you know what they're doing? They're going into audio video stores. They're finding exactly what they want because they can see it and play with it. And then they're going out of the store and going home and ordering on the net. <laughs> and actually, that makes a whole lot of sense, financial and otherwise. But things are going that way. Uh, we're going to talk about the net and artificial intelligence, but I want to talk with John uh, for a second about monsters. Uh, monsters, John, like Bigfoot. You've heard yeah. of Big, Bigfoot, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to hear something, John. Listen carefully to this now. This, uh, by almost every Bigfoot expert I've ever talked to, is the legitimate sound recorded in the woods uh, of Bigfoot. And it's a pretty freaky sound. But listen to this sound carefully uh, for a second. John, that's a monster. Yeah, my dad and my uncle have heard that sound. Really? Yeah, they have their own story. Monster. Yeah. Now, what uh, what does your Bible tell you Okay. this is? Let's drop back to Genesis 6. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children to them to be mighty men which were of old men of renown. And these were giants. And when we look in the fossil record, what do we see in common with all of these different fossils and stuff? We see huge things. We see giant lizards, giant bears, giant tigers, giant gorillas. Right. Uh, to me, that is a prime indication that somebody was fiddling with genetics, and specifically uh, those those genes that have to do with giantism. Somebody? So, somebody, yes. I call them the sons of God. I believe that they were fiddling with genetics also. And that uh, they actually had a specific purpose with the Nephilim, that they wanted to conquer the world. So before they actually got to producing children that were giants, they probably experimented with, with nature. And now when you draw it, it says the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, that was a violent time. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Right. There's an indication in the fossil record, and also right here what I just read, that all flesh may have been corrupted by this genetic experimentation that happened back then and probably is still happening now. So when you think about that, there's a possibility that there could be uh, numerous creatures that are running around that are products of genetic experimentation. Okay, let's see what this gene does. Let's see what that gene does. And the result is... You get giant creatures, you get creatures that are part human, part ape, you get creatures that are uh, El Chupacabras with supernatural power. Uh, a large uh, could be the result of that. But see, we don't have, we have a gazillion reports, for example, of the Chupacabra. Mm -hmm. We have hundreds of animals that have been autopsied, uh, two fang marks in their neck, all the blood gone from their bodies. Mm -hmm. Seemingly supernatural but nobody has ever captured that I know of, although we have a couple of interesting well, see, that's pictures, a uh, chupacabra. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems like they're in a kind of a realm that's not fully physical. Right. Well, see, these, these uh, Nephilim may have been in that same category because it says uh, these were men of renown, men that legends have been made after. And when you analyze, like... Uh, Norse mythology, Greek mythology, Sumerian theology, uh, you find these beings that often had supernatural power. So when we're talking about genetic experimentation, we're also talking about the possibility that these beings could have had supernatural power. Um, they were trying to create a genetically superior human being, uh, superior in size, superior in strength, superior in intelligence, and possibly psychic power. The ability to do things with the mind. Uh -huh. And that's why uh, I see this, you know, as a possibility that these monsters that we're seeing running around, you know, they're products of 
of uh, demonic beings uh, coming down and fiddling with our, our life forms that we have here on Earth and coming up with all kinds of things and just turning them loose because they don't care. I mean, this is just their laboratory with the lab rats, and uh, they're here to just wreak havoc. So, I mean, that's how I come up with that conclusion. Now, you've got a category called uh, mythical creatures, like right. vampires and werewolves. Do you believe they are purely mythical, or do you think that there is or has been such a thing as a vampire? Because uh, I've talked to them. Well, they they <laughs> they, they begin as a myth, such as um, the, the legend of Dracula, for instance. It, it comes from um, Romania. Vlad the Impeller. Right. And from there, uh, a lot of superstition and, you know, even people that uh, took information from the Bible saying that, you know, actually in the in the, uh, those days that they considered these beings to be demons. Um, this is just a specific name for a demon. But it, it starts as something real and then falls into legend. And then when people start to strongly believe in these things, well, then that opens up a door because there's beings out there waiting for an avenue in which to come in and so voila, and assume the, a role. The monster from the id creates the reality. Right. In and of itself, it's not real, but there's beings out there ready to assume that identity. Well, to us, it would be as real as real is. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if an entity assumed the reality, or not reality, assumed the image uh, that we had created over the years finally is a myth mm -hmm. so there might be a vampire there there might be a creature that lives only by taking the blood of the living plus you you might want to consider what i wrote about thought forms and the power of, of thought to be able to generate energy that can do things um like the studies of um uh, of uh, thought forms and where they actually created a pseudo entity didn't really exist um, this was done by the London Society for Psychical Research. They created a, a false entity called Philip. It was actually able to move a table across a room. Philip? Nobody there. So how, how did they create the entity? They created this fake being by gathering in a room and concentrating and talking and, cre and just uh, talking about this person for years, uh, for several years and thinking about this person that never existed, and they had to actually research to make sure that this person never existed, but they put a lot of intense mental effort into this Oh, project. that's really very interesting. And they actually created Philip. this being, yeah, Philip, that didn't really exist. And uh, actually there's roots of this in Tibetan occultism. They call it a tulpa. A except that there, were, there began then to be physical manifestations mm -hmm. of this creation of their... Their, their minds? minds? Yes, of their minds. By the way, it was only Philip, right? Not Philip and Terence, just Philip. Yeah, there were others that came later, but Philip was the most successful. I see, all right. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, yes, the mind may be able to have a power to be able to initiate something like that, but once the energy is there and the doorway is open, there are beings out there that are waiting uh, to assume that identity, and they may even be able to harness that energy. Um the case of uh, Alexandra Neal, the lady, first lady to enter in Tibet and to study their, their practices, right. she apparently created this being as a tulpa, and it was actually physically seen by other people. But according to her experience, this being started to change and became malevolent, um, became evil. It would attack her and stuff, and she actually had to go through these different rituals in order to defuse it. To defuse it. But to me, that's an indication that she may have initially created it but something else came in later on and took that energy over. Wow. And the same could be said for, for legends like vampires and werewolves, where you have hundreds of people all believing in the same thing. So when energy is there, and then something just comes in and harnesses the energy, assumes the identity, and then takes it to the next step, feeds the fear, and then generates more fear, and then in uh, return gets, gets that energy. And so we are what we think, or we create what we think. To a certain degree, yes. I do believe that, that the power of the mind, that there is something to that, but uh, not so much so to rule out you know, anything that would be contrary to Scripture. John, have you ever seen a movie called At Play in the Fields of the Lord? No, I have not. No, huh? 
it um, it was a. If you ever get the opportunity, go rent it uh, and see it, and give me your. It's about some missionaries that go down into the uh, Amazon, and they encounter a tribe that, of course, um, has never met a modern man before, and they have a lot of things they believe in which don't include the God we know. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to try to change them. Uh, what they do in the end is utterly destroy them, bringing disease, flu, things that this uh, tribe uh, has never encountered before. And so they end up uh, uh, killing them. And toward the end, they find out they really didn't convert them anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, rice and trinkets and toys. And for whatever reason, you know, the tribe's people would, uh, you know, cotton to these things and want them, of course. And so they just sort of put on a face and went through the ritual, as it were. Uh, but they didn't believe a thing, and then the, the poor people in the end ended up uh, uh, dying, I, I think, of disease brought in. H how do you feel about that kind of evangelism? Uh, I think that they went about it all wrong. <laughs> What's the right way? I mean, just as an initial reaction, uh, I would say that uh, as a missionary, they went about it all wrong. Uh, when you're when you're initiating uh, first contact with uh, a people that have never heard about the Lord, uh, they need to know uh, very fundamental things in such a way that I mean that that it won't destroy them. Obviously, I mean that's not God's way of doing things. God brings uh, salvation; He doesn't bring destruction. Oh, I don't know, John. There's an awful lot of wars going on. And off, a lot of those wars. Well, a lot of wars go on in the name of religion, but the name of God barely have anything to do with God. Yeah, but every side, uh, even Saddam Hussein. You remember when he talked about the mother of all battles and everything? It was God on his side. Well, consider that Saddam Hussein is a Muslim, and the basis of the Muslim religion is, is war. Uh, that is not the basis of what Christ taught. Christ taught love your enemies. I don't see how you can go and destroy a people when you believe that you should love your enemies. No, the Japanese were mainly Buddhists. Uh, they are thought to be pretty peaceful, but, uh, you know, there was Pearl Harbor and all that. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, there's a lot of destruction done in the name of... Uh, that's true, and I think that's because humanity is involved. As long as you're going to have people, you're going to have uh, mistakes. You're going to have things that just are not gone right. And uh, it's a learning experience, especially for, like, a missionary that's in a situation like that. And uh, I really have a heart for a person like that because that's a tough job. I mean, you see these people, and your heart cries out for them, and you want them that actually came to Earth as a human being and showed himself to humanity uh, as a being who loves who loves us and who's reaching out to us. And, and yet, you know, how do, how do you do that <laughs> without... You know, disrupting everything that part of their life uh, be about. John, what's uh, you know what astral projection is, right? Yeah. The ability of some people to leave their bodies. Mm -hmm. I've done it once, John. Yeah, you know, I heard about that. Did you? You heard about it? Well, it did happen to me. It was brief. It was. Um, I didn't volunteer for it. I didn't try to make it happen. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And others are able to leave their body as a practice. Yeah. Now. What is a person doing when they're doing that? I mean, I, I, I never... Where in the Bible is it covered that you can separate your soul from your basis? Okay. Uh, Genesis 11 speaks about a time when all the people in the world spoke one language. And at that time, it says that they decided to gather together and build this big tower. I assume it was a temple where they had their worship and religious practices. Mm -hmm. And then scripture says that they were reaching to the heavens and they were obtaining so much knowledge from this activity surrounding this tower that God actually came down and intervened. And this is the only time in the history of humanity where God has come down and said, man is obtaining too much knowledge. I've got to put an end to it. Now, I'm the only one so far of that I know of that has come up with this bizarre theory, but I think that what they were doing is that during their, their rituals and stuff, they were taking a bunch of 
different types of drugs, which are always involved in, in different rituals and ancient religions. Mm -hmm. They discovered a side effect. They could leave their body. And when they had that happen to them, they decided, wow, well, that was fantastic. So they incorporated it into their practice. Then they began to, to they found out they could go out into outer space, and they were not hindered. That's right. And they were able to travel to other worlds and even see other worlds. That's correct. That's when they crossed the line because that's when it would have been come, become possible for them to travel into a glorified realm and just Satan corrupted earth. That's also correct. So God put an end to that. But before they were stopped, I imagine they were obviously collecting information about stars how the stars were positioned, where they went last time so that they can continue. This In other words, they were learning too much. This is where astrology comes from. And the fact that they attributed beings to stars is, is uh, obvious. They saw beings there at these other planets, so they attributed beings to the stars. Oh. But they were within different... They were actually in the heavens because it says they were reaching into the heavens. And nothing could be withheld from them. Yeah, at the higher levels, there are people who can cl uh, claim today they they can do that. Mm -hmm. And see, it's coming back. That ancient knowledge is coming back. And when you look in scripture, you see all kinds of information about sorcery and magic. It all comes from astral projection. Astral projection uh -huh. is like a key. It unlocks that ability within really within the mind and within the spirit. So it's a very dangerous thing from your point of view, right? It, it is very dangerous. Now, what happened to you, J John? Hold on. We'll get to what happened to me. We're at the top of the hour, and when we get back, I do want to open the lines. I'm sure you have questions for John Myler. I'm Art Bell, and this is Coast to Coast AM from the high desert. Good morning, everybody. John Myler is here. We're talking about all manner of things. Aliens, he says. Yes, they're here. He's a Christian, but he says they're in the Bible. That's the title of his book, as a matter of fact, Aliens in the Bible. Thought forms, artificial intelligence, ghosts, even monsters, all here. Even vampires, werewolves, perhaps cooked up by our own ids, you know, the monster within us, but they are here, says John. A lot we haven't covered, but we are going to open the line in a moment, uh, in fact, right now, really, and let you ask any question you would like. Once again, of course, the big breaking news is that yesterday we uh, got photographs of a large piece of the Antarctic uh, Ross ice shelf that was uh, cracked and looked like it was going to break off. And we brought you those pictures on the website. They are there now. A lot of people couldn't find them because we had to send them to the links page. So Keith has now put up under the newest items, if you want to go to my website, the photographs of this now iceberg because yesterday it was a crack today it's cracked now this is not your normal iceberg breaking off from the Ross shelf this one is 183 miles by 22 miles or think of it this way 4247 square miles in size a calving of the iceberg actually moved the boundary of the Ross Ice Shelf southward 25 miles. Now, here's a little other news. Headline, researchers find ocean warming even in the deepest depths, the Associated Press. Scientists have discovered a significant, even surprising warming of the world's oceans over the last 40 years, proving new evidence that computer models may be on target when they predict the Earth's warming. The broad study of temperature data from the oceans dating to the 1950s shows average temperatures have increased quite some bit more than expected, about half a degree Fahrenheit closer to the surface and one-tenth of a degree, even at depths of up to 10,000 feet below the surface. Now... This will mean, while it sounds small, bigger storms, more energy. In fact, I suggest you read the book. Um, I suppose you've seen the story about the uh, about our book, The Coming Global Superstorm. It may well be a Ted Cer a Turner a miniseries. So before it appears on TV, I suggest you check it out book plug book 
plug. It's called The Coming Global Superstorm by Art Bell and, of course, uh, my friend Whitley Strieber. And it's coming true day by day by day by day. John, uh, the world's climate is clearly changing. Huge pieces of ice breaking off uh, down in the Antarctic. Um, 40 or 50 percent of the ice in, in the Arctic, the depth is gone. Now we find out the uh, oceans are warming. Some pretty strange things are going on, John. Yeah. All a part of the signs that uh, this is the end times. Um, Hal Lindsey, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of him. I've interviewed Hal. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he's, he's compiled a, a very large list of, of weather changes. Um, I don't even know if I could add to it. <laughs> uh-huh. It's uh, uh, definitely a lot of weather changes going on. We were talking about astral projection, <laughs> and you said my event. Uh, yeah. You did hear about that. It was very quick. And uh, mm-hmm. any comments on that, too? Um Okay, well, to begin with, in and of itself, like, how could you help what happened to you? You know, uh, it's just something that happened. Uh, but uh, I would say that it, there's, there's danger around it. Uh, it's involved with sorcery and magic, which are both forbidden in scripture. Uh, now I'm not saying you were doing any of that or anybody else just has a spontaneous event like that. Uh, now there's a couple things to say about, and, uh, first of all, when you're out of your body, what's laying on your bed? An empty shell, right? Yep. To me, that would seem like a very uh, vulnerable target for something that's looking... I've said the same thing, but those who claim they travel out of body say, hey, no problem, you well, always of come course. back. <laughs> um, I, I've read a couple of books from people that have astral projected, and there's another warning sign that I have come across is that uh, I have yet to find one that doesn't contradict Christianity and and support Eastern mysticism and the idea that we are uh, one with God and all these other uh, things and that the Bible says are are just flat out wrong. Now I, I didn't do the Shirley MacLaine go to the halfway to the moon or the moon or whatever. Mm-hmm. I just popped out and popped back in again. Mm-hmm. Now let me tell you something that might surprise you and some of the audience. The woman lying next to me in this hotel in Paris, my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, practices sorcery and uh, magic and uh, witchcraft. I'm sure that had something to do with it. <laughs> I've got a feeling you might say that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. All right. R- one more subject, and then we're going to open the lines. Reincarnation. Mm-hmm. There appears to be strong evidence, John, that souls come back again and again and again. That it's not just one trip to Earth, but perhaps many. Now, most who believe in the Bible say that's baloney. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I not only have an answer for that, but I have a possible explanation for all of the uh, evidence that appears to support it. First of all, when you're looking at the Bible and trying to find reincarnation, you should start with Hebrews 9.27. Man is appointed to die only once, and then comes the judgment. Right. It's clearer than that. Well, so, and, and yet the stories are, uh, John, that once reincarnation actually was part of the Bible and was voted out by mere mortals, literally voted out. You, you know about that? I would say that if it was voted out, it would have been under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The reason I say that is because reincarnation goes against everything that Jesus taught. Consider this. Reincarnation is man's work. Man's own work he has to do in order to achieve oneness with God. The doctrine of the gospel says man in his own effort can do nothing. Man needs God to step down to his level. That's why God became a human being and came to us to take us to him. Then when a hypnotist regresses a patient back into a former life where the patient may begin to speak another language, may describe surroundings of another country, or even may be a different sex, what has the hypnotist run into, John? Okay, well, now you're talking about hypnosis. Yes, sir. That's another bag right there. 
Uh, I've read a lot about it. Uh, the reason it's not valid in courts is because once you're under a deep state of hypnosis, you're highly, su- su- uh, what do they call that? You're suggestible to whatever is said to you. Okay, so. Yes, but, is- but, but if all you're doing is asking somebody to get younger and younger and younger and recall things earlier in their life, and suddenly they're recalling things prior to their life. Let me give you an example. You're growing younger and younger and younger. You're in your womb. You're now out of your womb. You're flying backwards in time and time and time. Right there, you just made a suggestion. You're telling that person that they're flying backwards in time, right. whether they did or not. So, since memory is reconstructive itself, the mind has an amazing capacity to be able to create whatever you suggest to it. So, even simply saying you're flying back in time, now you feel that you're in a body. Open your eyes. Now, I've read these cases, and I've actually read the transcripts of hypnosis sessions. They're highly suggestive. So, you can't really prove reincarnation with hypnosis, but there are other cases that are a lot more convincing than that, where people weren't under hypnosis, like uh, kids in India. I mean, it's it's actually not, and these kids are not undergoing hypnosis, and yet they're remembering facts about people that have been verified. That's a lot harder to discredit. Yes, I agree with you, and, and so how do you? How do you? Well, you remember what I said about ghosts. Well... Yes. The possibility exists that people could get possessed by spirits of the deceased. So if that possibility exists, then the possibility must also exist that they contain the memories of people that are deceased. They would have to be from hell, yes? Deceased from hell. Not possessed by the remnant of somebody who's gone to heaven. Yes. Well, now, see, it could be either. It could be. It could be a psychic phenomenon where they're actually picking up energy uh, of emotions and thoughts and such that uh, once were there that were left behind, and they perceive that. Then again, it could be spiritual possession by an unclean spirit, as Scripture would call it, and they would misinterpret all of the thoughts and emotions and feelings, the personality of another person, as their own. And especially if it's young in life, when you're not really even fully developed yourself, of course you would think that, you know, you were somebody else. All right, John, I would like to expose you to some calls, so let's uh, give it a shot here. Wildcard Line, you're on the air with John Myler. Hi. Uh, great program, Mark. Uh, John, you're right about uh, what your interpretations are regarding the species. And the giganticism that you're talking about is is documented in the Book of Enoch, which Father Malachi Martin said the church had had completely uh, endorsed, but was not official church canon. And if I could, Art, just two uh, quotes of Scripture from the Book of Enoch and then the translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm-hmm. It's, Thou hast seen what Zazel has done, how he has taught every species of iniquity upon earth. And then the Dead Sea Scrolls goes on to say, it says the 200 angels choose animals on which to perform unnatural acts, including presumably humans. 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200 rams, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field, from every animal, from every bird, for miscegenation. Mm-hmm. So I think that you're absolutely right about uh, about what they, these angels did. The beginning of what's uh, it, it happening again, and I wanted to ask you, could you say that you could pray through Christ for the help of the saints and have some kind of, uh, of good uh, of, uh, stuff come to you from that? Some kind of good stuff. I mean, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like you know, praying to the saints through Christ. Oh, you mean like Catholicism? Yes. Okay. Well, I believe when Scripture says there's only one mediator, but this alone, um, I think that's exactly what he meant. That you don't need a middleman. You can go right to the head cheese. You saying we don't need the Pope? No. No. Why would well, you need some he's, he's middleman a... when you can go right to the big? Oh, so you are you are saying we don't need the Pope? No. I mean, I'm not going to downplay the Pope, and I'm. I'm but but I already you're, probably stepped in it. Um, you probably did. You're saying uh, he's not a mediator. The Pope is not. part of an organized religion, but yes. if you read the doctrine of the Gospel and the doctrine of Christ, it talks about a relationship, not a religion. So the Pope has no greater relationship to God 
or is no is, or is no greater a mediator to uh, to God for the human race where the than, Pope a, is than at, anybody else. Is that true? Where the Pope is at with the Lord is his business. That's between him and God. Gotcha. And where I'm at with God, that's between me and God. Gotcha. And see the Pope. I mean, you don't you don't need to go twist Mary's arm, or you don't need to go beg to the Pope to to ask the saint to go to Jesus. You can go straight to Jesus and that's okay the scripture. All right. Good luck, John. I know I already stepped in it. But... Here with John Myler. Hi. Hi. Uh, you're going to have to yell at us, dear. You're not very loud. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. And a lot of the things that you're talking about, I have read um, in books written in the 1970s, okay? Uh, there was a lady named Jane Roberts who actually had classes in New York in the 1970s where the class actually had astral projections all at the same time. Um, it was fascinating to read about. And this lady died in the 80s, by the way. Um, and they never encountered any oh, uh, bad stuff. things about yeah. this at all. I know. Listen, everybody I interview about astral projection says it's safer than flying. In fact, Jane Roberts, in one of her books, wrote that one time she went out in astral projection, and she was she was a baby. She finally figured out that she was a baby, and she she didn't know what she was doing right away. But when she finally knew where she was and where she projected herself, her mother was standing on the porch, and she was trying to take her first steps. She realized that she was a baby trying to take her first steps and walk. Um, she had done phenomenal things in astral projection. Uh, well, John admits phenomenal things are possible, but he's saying that it's a dangerous thing to be doing. That uh, you're that's at right, and you know you're and, literally at play in the fields of the Lord. It it could be a spiritual gift. There's a number of Christian saints, believe it or not, monks that have been noted for being in more than one place at the same time. So I'm not saying that it's entirely demonic. Yet, whenever I pick up a book on astral projection and read it, it's always contrary to Scripture. Warning bell number one, the body over here. And then, lastly, when you're in that environment, in a spiritual environment, you're in a place that you have no idea what's around you. Just like there's viruses and bacteria floating in the air around us, but we know about them. But in the spiritual realm, there's going to be things that you just simply don't know about. It's like a child playing around on a construction site. And humanity is not ready for it. And John, just... I'll, I'll give you one thing. Um, everybody I've had on, the best experts on astral projection in the world, I've had them here. Mm -hmm. There's only one question that they cannot answer. Yeah. After they say how safe it is, nobody ever it, it loses a body while they're away or gets... How uh, could you prove that? <laughs> well... What if they died? You'd never know. Well, see, that's it. Uh, in other words, a lot of people in America and around the world die in their sleep. Mm -hmm. So, how do we know that some of these travelers out of body don't die? And, you know, they just say, uh, how many times do we read, well, he died peacefully in his sleep? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, um, for that matter, that. we don't even know that it was really peaceful. He might have died <laughs> in agony, right? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I do have a, a one commentary from um, Pastor Benny Hinn, which... Uh, he's sort of a controversial evangelist. But he all right, claims well, I'll tell you, we're at the bottom of the hour, so hold on to it, all right? Okay. We'll be right back. John Myler. Yes, and John Myler is here, who probably has himself in trouble with just about everybody right now. The phone call should be rather interesting. <laughs> he is uh, a Christian who believes they are here and they are real. Uh, some may be satanic in nature, but some may not be. In other words, they may really be here. And that's a rather unusual view. His book is called Aliens in the Bible, and I presume you can get it in most of the usual suspect locations like Amazon.com and bookstores and stuff like that. We'll ask about that in a moment. From the Kingdom of Nye, 
more Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Here again is Art. I would like to remind everybody that the week coming up uh, is going to be a little different. Instead of Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, as I am normally here, I will be here instead Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Wednesday with uh, Dr. Brandenburg, a plasma physicist and rocket scientist and a member of uh, NASA's Technical Advisory Committee of Technology and Commercialization. Boy, I can't wait to get my hands on him. Monica Ricks Paxson will come with him about the environment. They have authored a book. Check out the name of the book, folks. Dead Mars, Dying Earth. Dead Mars, Dying Earth. You're going to definitely want to uh, be around for that. Then the following night, the man who really began the whole remote viewing thing, Ingo Swan, is going to be here. And then Friday night, Saturday morning, it'll be Major Ed Dames. It's going to be a very, very interesting week next week in more ways than one. So remember that. See Wednesday, Thursday. Next week, it'll be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Back now to my guest, John Myler. And uh, great to have you back, John. Thank you. Um, there's a late, John, that human life did not, in fact, begin at all on Earth, that it began on Mars. In fact, a big movie about it here recently, which was um, a consulted, uh, uh, NASA consulted on the movie Mission to Mars. You probably haven't seen that yet, but... Yeah, I did. Oh, you saw it? Mm-hmm. Same mm -hmm. message that I was telling you about earlier, that they created us yep. and that they will help us to evolve, yep. to be gods. Yep. Blasphemy. Baloney. Yeah. Well, um, that part that, to their, their message, the, the fact that they're there, that they're beings, that they're out there, that's true. But this, this big message that they're saying that there are gods and that they're going to help us be one with God and be it as God, mm -hmm. uh, that's the part that's complete deception. Gotcha. All right, here we go. First time caller line, you're on the air with John Myler. Hello. Yes, sir. Hi, where are you? Okay, I'm calling you from uh, Palm Beach. All right, Palm Beach. Okay. Turn your radio off. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, um, to your guess, most Catholics have a theory of reincarnation. My doctrine does not teach reincarnation per se, we, have, we believe in astral projection no more than uh, a cat can blink his eye. I, I love the Catholics, but we, we believe in reincarnation in a doctrinal sense. We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye versus after death and after the quickening rapture. This is after death. And uh, I, I don't believe that we will we'll live again here on earth in, in the sense of uh, 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 reincarnation. I, I think that's what you stated. But I do believe that um, one day we shall be changed from mortal to immortality. Well, yeah, well, you're talking about the rapture, and that's yes. hardly the same doctrine as reincarnation. What do you reincarnation think? Reincarnation suggests that, that you die that's right. and that you come back to Earth that's right. in a cursed body, and you, you get born again. And you well, or maybe in a somewhat less cursed body. It dies, therefore it's cursed, not immortal. All right. uh, what he's talking about is the resurrection of the dead, which is specifically mentioned in the Bible, and and uh, that, the, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and that we will be uh, physically reunited with our spiritual bodies. I mean, this applies to those that die in Christ. And yes, I fully believe in that, and, but I don't consider that reincarnation. Although I guess you could. In a one way, night I asked uh, callers, just for fun, uh, what, what would be their attitude if they woke up one day and all of the born-again Christians were gone? <laughs> gone. What would be yours? Vacuumed up. <laughs> well, um... You know, that's a pretty good question. You mean if I was still down here, which mm -hmm. in all likelihood I would be? Would you pick up a Bible? <laughs> uh, or not even that, you know, just, I don't know. Okay, God. I don't know either. My eyes are open. <laughs> what now? Um, okay, well, in, in some ways, I don't see how the belief in a rapture and check this one out, um, what the Heaven's Gate folks believed are all that different. How about that? Okay. First of all, 
the rapture does not say that people are killing themselves. The rapture says that God comes and takes them away. That's true. Although, so, although the end effect is roughly the same physically. With the exception that committing suicide is starkly against Scripture. That's true. And people simply disappearing off the, the planet. Uh, that's something God's doing. That's God's true. in control. So, uh, to me, I would say that would, that should be an eye opener. If you have people telling you, look, the Bible says this is going to happen. The Bible says this is going to happen, you know, over and over again, saying that to you and saying, you, you know, you need to read the Bible or at least, you know, ask God if he's real. Really seek him out because he'll answer you and he's a real and personal God and he won't leave you high and dry if you really want to know. And uh, they're telling you all of this and then all of a sudden, boom, this happens. Well, John, I've asked and I have not yet had an answer. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've done that. Show me a sign. We all probably have done it in our in our heads privately, Keep really asking. reverently, uh, re with reverence rather. And um, I've never had an answer yet. Keep asking. Sometimes it's slow coming. I asked for quite a while, <laughs> and you know I was involved in, in a lot of things, and I was searching. And I can I can tell you know that the fact that you have this show on and that you're involved in all of these things that are you know spiritual in nature. Searching, yes. It, it shows me that you're searching, and I think as long as you're searching, the Lord will see that and He'll honor that and. Your day's coming. I think your day's coming. Well, my day's coming. That's for sure. Um, I know my day's coming. I mean your day that you're actually going to believe. Because <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, well, how can somebody search for so long and not find? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Good, uh, that's my question. Um, wild card line, you're on the air with John. Hi. Uh, hi. This is Wayne from Portland, Art. How you doing? Fine. Uh, hi. How you doing, John? Okay. Uh, I've got to take you to task a little bit, John. I have a question for my wife, who is a Reformed Catholic, and one for myself, please. Yeah, I, I should have said it. <laughs> okay. Uh, my wife asked. Uh, she says that if the Pope is not an intermediary to God, you only need Jesus. She says, then why do you need Jesus? Why can't you just go directly to God? Jesus is God. He said before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are all God. Three in one. There you go, sir. Okay, now the... Uh, Tell your wife. <laughs> My question is, considering that the Bible has been changed so many times to match different political regimes of man... And there really isn't the same version that was written at the time of Jesus. What is the right book? I mean, how can you go by the Bible? How about that, John? How can you go by the Bible? Well, if God has the power to be able to create atomic particles and form up a universe, I think he would have the power to be able to keep a book intact. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if he was that involved in uh, keeping the word straight through the translations and all of that, how I come? I think he was. They were, the Hebrews are meticulous about every jot and tittle, as it says in Scripture, that they didn't make, they, they made sure that not even across... Where was God when the Manhattan Project was going on? Manhattan Project. Yeah. Where was God when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor? Where was he when the Germans were shoveling Jews into ovens? Where was God then? The he, word in the book, keeping the word in the book straight, but where was God during all these other times? Okay, well, let me just say this. God is love, and he created beings that are love. Uh, well, he created them because of love. But in order for love to have meaning, there has to be free will. Correct? Now she's just got a bunch of puppets running around saying, yeah, I'll do this, yeah, I'll do that. Yes, okay. There's no choice. Right. But God had to create choice in order for love to have meaning. And because there's choice, there's the possibility for evil to exist, which God will allow to exist, but only for a time. That's why Satan only reigns for a season. And all of this is because Satan is allowed to reign for a season. Okay. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Myler and Art Bell. Good morning. Yes, this question is for both of you gentlemen. All right. If a vampire such as Brad the Inhaler was on the verge of a Maalox moment, do you think he'd have the decency to astrally project himself to a restroom, or is his evil so profound that he'd just shrug it off? Well, based on your question, I'd say offhand, he sent you. Well, this is something that, that, that's, that the, that's the answer you're getting. This is something I've, I've he personally said. Vlad, to deal with. Vlad the inhaler sent you. <laughs> well, he? I, I wish he'd adopt my manners then. Well, I wish he would too. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with uh, John Myler and Art Bell. Good morning. Hello. 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 Yes, I'll make this quick. It's just for both of you fellows. Uh, you guys were mentioned about the Ouija boards. I just want to tell you a very quick story about black power and what happens when you cross the line. Okay, I'm calling from Edmonton. Um, 
I'm, I'm Catholic and I'm very religious. And I was living near the university, and there's five other tenants and myself living in this home. And we all had our belongings in this garage. And our landlady was from, she's from Trinidad. And over a four month period, she told us, look, get all the stuff out of the garage because I want to use it sometime. So, you know, we didn't know to no avail. Lo and behold, we came back one day and everything was gone. I was so incensed that I was going to burn the house down that night, but the only reason I, the only reason I didn't, because there was a fellow with a wheelchair living on the top floor. So I didn't. And I was fuming for six to seven weeks. I, I thought, how am I going to get back at this woman? And one day I was sitting in my kitchen and I was doing the dishes. I had a dish rag in one hand and another. And I thought, Jesus, I gotta get her somehow. If I can't get her physically, I gotta get her somehow. Then I thought, maybe I can get her on a psychological level. And knowing that she's from Trinidad, I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll just put a hex on her and I'll tell her. It'll freak her out. And soon as I thought, wait, 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 wait. what? No, I just, I, I thought, I, I. I didn't know how to get back at this woman, so I thought I'd get back to her on a mental level. So I was just going to tell her, look, I'm going to put a curse on you or a hex. I thought, you know, oh, that was just... Oh, a hex. What? I was just going to use that for an example, just to tell her to freak her out mentally, because of the background of where they're from. And the second I thought of that, I thought, yes, yes, that's what I'm going to do. I'll freak this woman out. And as soon as I said that, I had this dish rag in my hand and this thick glass, like I was telling you, and I happened to look up, and I have a crucifix above my kitchen door, yes. and at that same moment, this thing exploded in my hand. And let me just tell you this, it exploded in my hand, and it was like when someone draws from a cigarette and blows out the smoke. There was no glass, nowhere, nothing. And this thing just popped like someone shot out of my hand. <laughs> and, like, I'm very religious, and let me just say this to you. That, like you guys are saying about sign and calling this and that, well, I got my sign, and let me just tell you, there's certain things you do not fool around with. And this has got nothing to do with not mocking what you don't understand. I understand. All right. Well, yeah, all right. And it, it may have well come from the Lord, too. If you think about it, revenge is mine, say it the Lord. And he may have just been very upset if you were thinking to um, you know, convince this woman that you were involved in black magic. Well, again, see, I, this is the part I don't get. This is uh, what he, his problem was a microcosm compared, say, to what Hitler did at Auschwitz and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So minor. Uh, why would God intervene in such a minor manner into the ovens by the millions? Yeah. Well, God is, is... That's a hard one, huh? He, he deals with people and he deals with nations. And his reasons for letting evil exist in the world on a very fundamental level is because of love, that there needs to be a free choice. And they had the choice in Germany to listen to Hitler or to not listen to Hitler, uh, there were meetings that I heard about where pastors had gathered and Hitler had gathered with them, and uh, Hitler purposely had to make sure the church was staying out of the way in order for him to, to gain his rise in power, economic security. He promised them all that... And actually, the church did stay out of the way. Yeah, they did. Part, yeah. But there were there were people... Almost got, an, almost got an apology from the guy who's not a mediator here yesterday. Not quite, but almost. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, there were people that spoke up, but they were quickly hushed, uh, mainly out of fear. Uh, they didn't want to rock the boat or anything. And uh, I tell you, I think if, if the Christian church would have rose up at that time, Hitler would have never had that rise in power. Well, then maybe there'll be a forthcoming apology. Who knows? Anyway, listen, John, uh, your book, mm -hmm. uh, Aliens in the Bible, yeah. is actually on the net, right? Yes, it is. So in other words, this is not a book someone has to go buy? They can buy it if they want to read it in paper. Okay, okay so it is for sale. Yeah, it is. You, could you find it at Amazon.com? Yeah, you can, and i got a number right. if you want to call and order it over the phone. All right, good. Fire away. 1-888-795-4274. Uh, right. Yes. Okay, we always do this twice. 1-888-795-4274. Um, yeah. How it's, much is the book? Uh, 14 if you order paperback, like... Uh, Fourteen forty, I think. Fourteen forty. Yeah. For the and if you have a computer, you actually are giving it to people for free. Yeah, they can go there and read it for free. Yeah. What made you do that? Um, God. <laughs> John, and, you know, a good answer. I people guess. are going to say that I'm nuts, and I, I get people telling me I'm nuts because uh, I believe God communicates things to me. But I, I think if they're going to say that, they're going to have to category categorize every Christian into that same boat because God speaks to me and, and God speaks to anybody that says they have a relationship with Jesus. And so, I believe that God conveyed that to me. <laughs> so, I don't see how else I could do anything so nuts. So God said, 
put it on the net for free. For free. That's right. Um, what do you think about artificial intelligence eventually attaining virtual human abilities? In, uh, uh, in other words, the recognition of self, uh, that moment when we get a processor in self-awareness. That's right. Yes, I have a chapter uh, devoted to artificial intelligence. Yes. And, uh, when you read in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, uh, you, you find this beast, this being, whatever it is, evil, yes. uh, demands of humanity to create another being that is a sentient life form. So you're talking about a living being that is alive, that is man-made. To me, that is artificial intelligence. Huh. And what does this being do as soon as it, as soon as it is in place? It establishes world-dominating power, uh, establishes a global economic system, something that I think the Internet is geared right up for, and and then there's a, a, a mark that it establishes, uh, like a, a global tracking system, yeah. in order to integrate people into We're this coming new, up on that now, you know. to this new consciousness. Uh, I believe that mark will be a revolutionary computer technology. And you're using the same... Eventual mark to get your word out, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The internet. The internet. Isn't that interesting? All right, listen. You have been a fabulous guest, John. Thank you very much. Thank and you I very hope, much for having me on. I hope you sell lots of books and uh, people go to the internet and read away. Okay. God bless you. I'll be praying for you. <laughs> I need it. Thank you. Good.